In this episode of the Photography News Podcast, Roger gets nostalgic on a desert island, Kingsley learns a landscape lesson, and Will reveals all for a portrait. Hello and welcome to the latest Photography News Podcast. My name is Roger Payne. I'm the Editorial Director at Photography News. I'm joined once again by a couple of members of the Photography News team, and we're going to spend the next half hour or so chatting through various things photographically related. I'll start by introducing a man who uh, we've just watched spend 20 minutes put his microphone stand together, (laughs) ready to talk to us today. (laughs) He's contributing editor, Kingsley Singleton. Hi, Kingsley. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Is this the point where we discover that your (laughs) microphone's not actually working properly? Or it would be collapsing trombone style, wouldn't it, on the kind of... (laughs) <laughs> considering I, th- I suppose i thought you were supposed to be a really organized person that was quite painful to watch you i've never steadily. said <laughs> i've never claimed that i'm now imagining also this should be like the start of the muppets where gonzo something always happens to gonzo at the start of the muppets doesn't it <laughs> well, well welcome kingsley and the other person who was all ready and, and raring to go when we uh, when we joined our video chat mr photography and the editor of photography news will chung hi will Hi, Rog. Hi, Kingsley. Hope you're both well. We're very well. Thank you, Will. And nice to nice to have you along. So we thought we'd uh, start, as we usually do, by just uh, having a little chat about what we've been up to photographically. Um, the, the fact that the the lockdown is easing is certainly helping um, helping us all get out and about a little bit more. So, Kingsley, it sounds like you've been probably the most furthest afield out of all of us. So where, where have you been and what you've been up to? I yeah so I took the opportunity to go on a bit of a shooting trip to Devon and that involved um, the freedom to both kind of get out and do some landscapes and also shoot some pictures of my dogs on the beach which was kind of um, I hadn't like I hadn't really thought that much about it but that the second part of that the shooting the dogs on the beach is not something I've done at all I haven't really done any dog photography for months um, and it's not because I haven't been out but for some reason I don't know the the general lockdown as I, I don't know it, it has it's made me less sort of focused on taking the camera out with me all the time I think um but the landscape stuff this kind of goes back a little bit I think to the last podcast or the one before we were talking about trying to find poppies I actually managed to find some poppies um just on a sort of a hillside overlooking an estuary in Devon so I kind of had some fun taking pictures of those and I was keen to kind of continue this um long lens landscape thing um and so I ended up kind of doing things like just getting the poppies in the foreground all kind of defocused and leading into the landscape kind of that way. And the, the other thing, again, that was kind of weird because I um, I was forgetting some of the some of the stuff that you'd normally think about when you're out shooting landscapes, which is to, you know, which is to sort of stop and think before you take pictures. And I so I, I sort of set up and I was having a bit of trouble getting enough height on the tripod to get over this cornfield. Um, and it was only after I'd wasted about, well, not wasted, the pictures were okay, but um, I'd wasted about 10 minutes doing this. I suddenly realised that um, if I just walked around the perimeter of this cornfield, I got a much better angle. And that's when I started seeing all these poppies and wildflowers. So it's kind of feeds into that idea of like photography as exploration again, I think. But but it's rare, though, that you'll get the best picture the first time you press the shutter. Yeah, yeah. So like kind of working a little... You know, I mean, I think part of the thing about landscape photography, and I'm sure Will and you would agree with this, is that you it's not just about, as you say, kind of going somewhere, taking the picture and then leaving again. It's about kind of staying in a location and trying to almost like decode it, like solve the problem. You know, you particularly if you found your background, you know, then you start looking for your foreground or how you're going to frame it and that kind of thing. So like, it, it, like I say, there was a sort of a, a bit of a remembrance or a reminder that, of, of, of that's how you meant to shoot I think and did your pictures benefit from that probably not no <laughs> <laughs> but of course what everybody wants to know for previous podcast listeners will know the element of danger that you introduced in your landscape photography Kingsley so did you did you have any scrapes or um, you know was, any any shattered bits of filter in your hand again or anything like that was there an element of danger I don't I think that there was a the land that I was shooting on is not was not a public footpath and it and it's often used by people that run a pheasant shooting um thing so there was a sort of a the idea that I could possibly find someone coming around the corner with a double barreled shotgun so there was there was a slight sort of frisson of danger <laughs> <laughs> no personal injury 
No, not not on this occasion. Well, that that's that's good to hear. So, um, well, interesting stuff. Will, what about you? Uh, similar or or, or less less uh, exploratory? Um, to be fair, I haven't done much photography. I've kind of lost my mojo. Uh, but I did do some pictures, and don't get me wrong. And um, I did do another self portrait, which I was wondering if I should share this or not with everybody. But how I'm going to. Um, so I've got this project on self portraits. And I, I did one which I wanted to do for ages, but never got around to it. And that was basically uh, do a montage of myself. So I photographed bits of me in a way and then join them together. Right. So it's kind of a montage stroke joiner. And so I set the camera up at a certain height, set the self timer for, for nine shots on my Nikon and I'd move around. <clears throat> so I'd focus up and obviously I want nobody else to help me. So I focus up and I'd move within these nine frames. So I was different, you know, my back of my head then a little bit away from my head, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so I set a flash a flashlight up, the camera up, and maybe did 200 pictures of me in a in a shirt and tie um, facing the camera against a white wall, and that's fine. Fairly simple, and it was fun, um, but challenging because I had to keep on moving the camera and change different heights. So how are you presenting that? Like when it comes to kind of getting those different pictures, are you are you sort of putting them all into a Photoshop document with or without frames or kind of? I'm, I'm playing with them still Kingsley at the moment, but the, the fun bit came <clears throat> and I was thinking about this because my hair was a state at the time because I hadn't had a cut for months and I thought, I know what I'll do. I, I've never seen the back of my own head. <laughs> So I thought, I know what I do. I'll, That's I'll weird. Neither have I. You never, that's a common problem for human beings. It, it is. Really well, I thought, Rog, I'll get around it by actually doing the portrait. So I did it facing the camera. Then I also did it facing the wall. So I had my back to the camera. Right. And then I decided, I thought, maybe I should do this naked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is lockdown, so, folks. <laughs> so I did. Actually, to be fair, I kept my boxes on, but I did right. a, 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 a naked portrait from the back and a fully dressed portrait from the front in the same way. And I want to montage these pictures together. How will I do that, King? So I don't know, but I have started playing with them in Photoshop. But it's just basically saying slice the pictures and, and moving around in the Photoshop document. So right. that, sorry, that was one thing I did, um, which took up basically an evening. And then the other photography I, I did, I went on a, um, a bug hunt with my partner Annie and that was quite fun because you know I don't photograph insects and I realised how difficult it was um, but it was fun I got the ring flash out and got the macro lens out and ran across the field and tripped over things and got stung and all that sort of thing and turned out all these pictures that were not very interesting and out of focus so my bug hunt wasn't that successful. And can I can I clarify if that was naked or was that was that fully clothed <laughs> the bug hunt? That was fully dressed. <laughs> That's good to hear. I knew I shouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm slightly concerned, Will, about you saying that um, you, you feel like you've lost your mojo. I mean, this is presumably something that a lot of photographers go through. I mean, is, do you think this is a lockdown-related problem? Or, I mean, Kingsley kind of alluded to having the same sort of issue as well. So uh, what are you going to do to get it back? Well, for me, I mean, I, the first half of lockdown, if you like, I, I did an awful lot of photography. I was shooting literally hundreds of frames every day doing water droplets and oil droplets and all sorts of things and then I got a bit tired of that for, for obvious reasons it just got a bit dull and the thing is a lot of my things I've been working on my projects involve travel so for instance I've got projects on the Doctors Light Railway well to be honest right now I don't want to catch a train no I just don't feel I want to be in an enclosed space mouth you know face mask or not and my other project is about peers and the peers I've got to do are all miles away and the hotel's aren't fully open yet mm. and of course again they've got all the restrictions too so my my mojo i would get back as soon as these projects would start going to be frank right, but right now because there's certain things i can't do and i haven't found any poppy fields and it's too late now but i haven't found anything to go photograph and all my regular sources of inspiration are currently not available to me so it's only a matter of time rog for me so if anybody has got any ideas for how will can get his photo mojo back that's not easy to say. Um, then please get in touch with us at podcast at photographynews.co.uk. Um, unlike you guys, I've, I've actually been, although the weather's been rather rather nice, uh, I've actually been con confining myself indoors uh, and photographing uh, some 
cards, some greeting cards that my daughter has made. She wanted to set up an Etsy shop, an Etsy store, um, which I think I'm not particularly of a um, au fait with all these uh, all these online shops, but it's some kind of online sort of crafty style shop. Uh, and so she sent me these five cards that she wanted me to photograph to sort of make them look um, appealing. Um, yeah, so it was a lot of kind of like shot on grey on slate um, with sort of house plants in and all that sort of a whole a whole range of stuff really. Um, all shot with window light. I didn't bother using a flash at all. I just shot it all with window light and a reflector. And uh, yeah, she was pretty happy with the results. So what are you? I mean, what what does that look like from a range of pictures? Are you sort of shooting them flat lay and then doing some of them standing up and that kind of thing or? Yeah, exactly that. So I got the the first and probably the most important thing is that she sent me a really good brief about what she wanted, right. which was uh, which was really really helpful. Well, you'll you'll have to send her a really good bill as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but I got a really good brief. Um, yes, there was a combination of flat lay with and without envelopes. Um, I actually managed to find in a shop some um, heart shaped slate mats which sort of framed the um the card quite nicely yeah and then did some did some shots like i say with like a, a small kind of succulent house plant next to them and a cup of coffee and that type of thing so very lifestyle-y kind of yeah i think i think that's the kind of vibe that that etsy mm. is it's sort of a uh um you know a lifestyles you know type uh, type approach and uh, yeah she was i mean it was a nice way to pass a few hours and uh, she was very happy with them those elements of product photography i've always found sort of really interesting particularly the way people choose things like backgrounds and stuff we, we should get someone on to talk professionally about it shouldn't we kind of yeah absolutely yes. yeah it'd be good because i mean there is i mean there are some really really fantastic examples of of what looks good and then some equally some absolutely appalling examples of things that look, look I, yeah i saw a great guy i can't remember where this was i saw a great collection of images the other day of people who had tried to photograph mirrors to put them on ebay <laughs> <laughs> and all these stupid things that people try to do to not get themselves in the reflection <laughs> yeah thankfully she's not made any mirrors and obviously if she uh, if she ha if she does then maybe i'll uh, i'll politely decline yeah. that particular request to photograph them <laughs> moving on um this is something that um as we we talked about on the podcast the last podcast where will hatch this rather splendid idea of uh, coming up with our desert island camera kits um this was based on uh, something we were chatting about about lenses on the last podcast so if you've uh, if you haven't caught up on all the podcasts we uh, we'd love you to go back and listen to to some of the previous ones we've also got a fantastic interview that will did with charlie Waite, which is well worth uh, a listen if you're a a keen landscape photographer uh, and after some really useful advice there but the desert island kits idea really was um, exactly like the uh, the radio program. And so we set ourselves a little task uh, between us that we would come to this podcast with our desert island kits. And the, the rules are quite simple. Um, I know Will is going to elaborate on this slightly because he's made up some new rules just where we were chatting earlier. Um, but um, essentially, it's eight items of photographic equipment or photographic related items, one non-photographic luxury and a photographic book. Um, and obviously, in in keeping with the uh, the program of the same name or similar name, um, you can have one of the items that you would save from the waves if the waves got higher. So, Will, what was the extra bit of um, the extra rule that you made up just before we started recording? So I relaxed the rules enough to to give myself lots of freedom, and that meant that this set island would have mysteriously a source of power. It would, of course, have the latest computer loaded up with Photoshop. And a source of uh, form uh, cards and film, should you choose film. Okay. So basically, the eight items we pick are related to things you actually use to take pictures with, basically. So okay. I did relax the rules a little bit to make it a little bit more fun. Good. I suppose it would be more challenging if we, we said <laughs> you, you, didn't, you didn't have any power. Well, I hasten to add that the listeners that, that actually only myself and Kingsley were introduced to this uh, this concept half an hour ago, uh, whereas Will has <laughs> oh, obviously nice. had it in his head for four or five days at least. So uh, <laughs> therefore, he's obviously bent it to his own <laughs> to his own will. Um, anyway, go on then, Will. You may as well go first, seeing you're making the rules up as you go along. So uh, why don't you kick off with your with your things? 
can I just say to the listeners that I haven't made up any rules, and if you two read your emails earlier, you would have known that the rules existed. But nevertheless, I, I automatically file them. my emails from Will Chung. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll go through my eight items. So items one and two, um, Fujifilm GFX 50R with a 32 to 64 millimeter standard zoom lens. So this is a 51 megapixel uh, medium format camera, and it produces great files. And the reason I've picked it is very simple. Um, I get to test a lot of cameras in, in my professional life. And when I tested this, I liked it so much, I went out and bought the darn thing. And I love it. And I love it to the degree that if I was stranded on a desert island with a camera kit, that would be, I'll be very happy with that. But you should say stunning files, plenty of room to work with. Um, and I like working on that in that contemplative way on a, on a tripod, which leads to our items three and four. And that's item three is a Get So Systematic Series 4 tripod. I've picked the GT4533LS, which is a carbon fibre tripod. Right. And on top of that, we'll go an Arca Swiss ball head. <clears throat> so there again, I've got my camera, my lens, my tripod and my ball head. That's all good. OK, so can we just clarify that's a Jitsu, not a, not a Jitsu, yeah. is that correct? <laughs> well, if you come from northern Italy, well, it's called a Jitsu. Yeah, OK. Now, item five. Now, I, I, I've never done it before, but I've always been keen on astronomy. And I thought on the desert island there will be no light pollution. Therefore, I did some deep space photography. So I need a light tracking device so I can do these long exposures. So I picked okay. up a Fornax 10 Light Track 2. Now, I picked out for no other reason that that seemed to be the one on the website that people liked. That's so if it's the wrong one, then fine. But anyway, <laughs> to gadget, I can put my camera on the track space. Item six, because I've no doubt being on a desert island, my sensor is going to get very dirty. So I need a center cleaning outfit. And that included things like an Arctic butterfly, an LED loop to see the nasties, and obviously swabs and cleaning fluid. So item six was a center cleaning outfit. Okay. Item seven um, was going to be the case magnetic filter system, and that's a magnetic circular system. So the, the, the adapter rings screw onto the lens as normal, and they're round adapter rings, and the, the filters are in magnetic mounts, and they just clip on top. And the system has a polarizer, three types of ND, and lens caps. So that's basically so it enjoys the long exposures of the water as it laps on this, on this beach I'm stuck on. Um, yeah, you're going to have quite, plenty of plenty of options to shoot long exposure water shots, I think, by the sounds uh, of it. Absolutely right. <laughs> so the tripod obviously would come in super duper useful for that. Um, my eighth item is just an LED light. Um, I mean, there are any numbers I, I can pick, but I went for a Niwa 660 LED light panel, which is battery powered or mains. And it means I can read in the evening, basically. And also, you know, so I don't fall about in the dark. Is this so you can read the collected works of Shakespeare and the Bible? Is that is Indeed. that your, is that <laughs> that's actually right? And the other book I need, of course, you, you brought us nicely onto books because I'm actually a, a dunce of Photoshop. I've picked the Photoshop CC for photographers book by Martin Evening, right. so I can learn all about Photoshop while I'm stuck on this desert island. Uh, so, okay, that's that's my book. That's my kit. The must save item. Well, I mean, I'd, I would have to save the camera and lens. I know it's two items, but then that's another me bending the rules a little bit. So I thought I can't just save the body without the lens or the lens without the body. So the camera and lens I would have to save. OK. And then I started looking at luxury and I thought this, this is where you can have a bit of fun. I thought, should I have a, a lifetime supply of Merlot, for instance, mm. or, or should I have a grand piano? <laughs> so in the end, I decided have, and there is precedent for this, by the way. I, I did look it up. Um, I'm going to take with me as a luxury, and I'm now using it for reference and to enjoy, but I can't shelter in it. I know that. But I'll take the National Science and Media Museum from Bradford with me. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> and I'll say this a precedent. Helen McCorry, the, uh, the actress, only the other week, she decided to take the, I think it's a British museum, the V&A Museum. So there is precedent for doing it on the actual Desert Island disc. So I thought, okay. well, so, so I would take the National Science and Media Museum. There's an assumption, of course, that, I mean, I, when we talked about this, I think Kingsley and I both both conceived that the, uh, the the Desert Island was literally a mound of sand with one palm tree <laughs> on it. So I'm wondering where you're going to fit an entire museum. But <laughs> <laughs> you have to go with it, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we will. 
So a really interesting set of choices there, Will. I mean, I'm I'm surprised that you've gone you've gone modern with your cameras. I think part of the part of the sort of discussion that we had on the last podcast that kind of brought all this up was where we were talking about uh, there was a, an element of nostalgia to to the kit that we were talking about on that podcast. And I'm surprised that you've not gone you've really not gone old school at all, have you? You've gone very much new age. I have. I thought on this says I didn't. There's going to be plenty of time to do things. And I thought rather than keep on reflecting on the past, I'd much rather try and look forward and, and do something productive while I'm on the island. So that includes, you know, brushing on my Photoshop skills, taking loads of pictures. So rather than do film and mull about in the dark room, which I know some people might want to do, and I did think about that, but now I went modern, I went practical, and I thought, hell, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is me getting my mojo back, I thought. Fantastic. You could call it Mojo Island. <laughs> <laughs> Any further thoughts, Kingsley? I think it's a. I mean, it's it's a it's a broad, a broad sort of landscapers selection, really, isn't it? Of uh, of stuff. I I, I mean, I, I could see myself fitting into that um, section quite nicely, particularly the coffee shop of the uh, media museum. I think that's kind. Of, are you bringing the coffee shop with you, Will? The coffee shop, and also, of course, they've got a bookstall there as well. Yeah. But anyway, we don't know. It's, it's not for practical purposes. I just want to learn from it and, and wander around it. So I think enjoy the IMAX cinema as well. I mean, perhaps if you could build a small pier next to it, you could get some visitors on and sort of, you know, make a bit of dosh while you're there. And obviously photograph it for his pier and, project. Yeah. And then maybe you could build a small light railway running around the pier as well. <laughs> Well, I I'll jump into my list because um, I think I've I've gone the complete polar opposite of you, Will. And uh, I initially thought about yeah, well I'll probably buy I'll probably bring that camera because it's really good and that and, and so on and so forth. And then I thought well the whole sort of concept of desert island discs is much more around memories and how certain things remind you of certain times in your life. So. I think I've I've very much gone down that route and probably as a result brought uh, decided a whole load of kit that probably I'll end up getting really, really frustrated with after a relatively short period of time. But let me run through this. So the first two things are cameras. I've got two cameras. I'm going to start off by taking a Kodak Retinet 1B. Now, the reason why that is, is that that is actually the camera that got me into photography in the in the first place because it was my dad's camera. And I always held it in sort of great veneration of, of being able to take a picture sometimes with my dad's camera. He always used to load it with Kodachrome 64, 36 exposure, and it would last the whole year. So it would have Christmas at, at one end and some summer holidays in the middle and then Christmas at the other end. So you can understand why um, there was always a kind of uh, a special place if you actually got to take one of the 35 or 36 exposures on it. Um, Brilliant little camera, 45 mil road and stock lens on it, um, one fifteenth of a second to one five hundredth of a second shutter speeds and plus B. Um, so I'd take that purely from a nostalgic perspective because it's I've still got my dad's camera actually. He's uh, he very kindly gave it to me a few years ago. So I'll start with that, mm. and then the other camera I'd take is is a Nikon. You might be surprised to hear uh, another camera that I owned, and when I look back now, it's a camera that I really regret selling, and that was a Nikon F3. Um, now you may, I don't know if you'll remember, Will, um, the re when the F3 came out, the previous versions, Nikon F and the F2 were both, both fully mechanical, whereas the F3 wasn't. So when the battery died on it, um, you only had one sixtieth of a second as a mechanical shutter speed. But of course, you know, what more do you need than one sixtieth of a second? That's all you need, isn't it? So I thought I'd, I'd take an F3 body. Um, and I also thought because it was so solidly built, yeah, I could probably use it as some kind of device to knock things into things <laughs> like sort of a, a sort of hammer style device. Should I should I need it um, on that? I would put a Tamron 90 mil F28 macro lens. Another lens that I've owned was a fantastically sharp lens. And that having we spoke about previously on uh, on the podcast about our favorite lenses, I would definitely have a macro lens because of its versatility. And then given that I didn't know the rules that Will was gonna make up, <laughs> my fourth item is a supply of Ilford FP4 film, black and white film. And that's a sort of, I know it's called FP4 plus now, um, but from a nostalgic perspective, that just reminds me of my college days and when I first started taking pictures with, uh, with black and white film. So what I'm going to add to that is 
a Durst M370 black and white enlarger with lens. Uh, that's one item. Um, now, I did actually own the color version of this, which had little dials in the top that you could dial in if you were using multigrade or if you were printing color. Obviously, I'm only going to print black and white. But I thought in some by some way, I would be able to um, convert the device so I could only print at night under moonlight. <laughs> So, so that I would be rather than having your your power source, Will, I would in some way rearrange the mirror box so that I could shine the moonlight down, and so my exposures would be very long exposures, multiple minutes at f two point eight. Yeah. Um, so obviously, I need a dark room kit. So I'm going to have a kit of dark room stuff, which is trays. Um, I wouldn't bother with stop bath. I'd probably just dunk it in the sea in between the dev and the fixer. Um, and then obviously I need some paper to print onto. So my seventh item would be a, a, a let's say a lifetime supply of grade three Agfa record rapid paper, <laughs> which as anybody who has ever printed with Agfa record rapid will know, it's the best paper ever made. Uh, it's a fiber based paper. I'm pretty sure you could rinse it in seawater without it getting too damaged, but it's beautiful, creamy toned beautiful paper so anything that i thought was worth printing out i'd print onto ag for record rapid grade three so that's seven of my eight items and the last one is a bit weird but let me explain now will you'll remember this kingsley i'm not sure you will um the jessup's price list now <laughs> back in the day <laughs> jessup's used to produce a for anybody who doesn't know this forgive me if you do Jessup used to produce, I, I would say it was probably A, A2 or A1, Will. I think it's A1. It was an enormous, yeah, it was an enormous sheet of paper printed on both sides with every single product that Jessup's used to sell. Um, I reckon there was probably about fifteen to 20,000 lines on it, maybe. Thousands and thousands of things. And every single one of them had the price next to it and the Jessup's code next to it. Now, I used to work for Jessup's. I used to be able to remember a lot of the codes off that list. And so I could tell you, for example, that a roll of Kodak Gold 135 mil 24 exposures, the code is KOG 13524. And I, it's 30 years <laughs> since I worked in Jessup's. Um, so what I would, the, the, the Jessup's catalog would be for two reasons. First of all, because I would be able to make endless different kits up and find out how much, you know, I could have an imaginary amount of money to spend. I could think, what kit should I put together for a um, for a, a shooting at night or whatever? Uh, and also, I could learn the codes and keep my mind sharp. I also thought that, and that is the one thing that I would save. So that would actually, if you've seen Castaway, <laughs> I think the Jessup's price list would be my Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> or I'd probably call it Alan, as in Alan Jessup or something like that. Um, but yeah, so the Jessup price list is definitely the thing that I would want to hold on to um, more than anything else. This sounds like it could also be your book of choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be. But thank you for segueing beautifully into my book of choice, You're welcome. which I'm kind of slightly surprised that Will didn't pick this. But actually, I am slightly bending the rules here, which is quite in keeping what everybody else has done. Um, is that I'd like to take three books, but they work collectively as one um, uh, one group, if you like. And that is the Ansel Adams books, which is the camera, the negative and the print. Um, three books which I've which I've owned for a long time, never read. But I've liked the idea of reading them. So I'd take the time my time on the desert island. Certainly, Roger, I do applaud your choice of the books. I, that was on my shortlist. That's a three as well. Um, they are splendid books. And. Yeah, Adams is a hell of an inspiration to me too. And of course, you'd see what you were doing, shooting black and white on a desert island. Exactly. And this is the thing. So that just leaves me my my one final, um, my luxury and uh, non-photographic luxury. And this is probably quite predictable, but I would take my golf clubs and balls, an endless supply of balls, which I certainly <laughs> need because I'm just going to hit them all into the sea. But after photography, golf is definitely my next love. And so therefore... Um, I would I would definitely be uh, be taking a set of golf clubs. I'd probably get quite good at playing out of bunkers as well if it's uh, if it's a, a sandy a sandy desert island as we think it's going to be. So that that's my uh, that's my slightly nostalgic list. Any thoughts, um, gents? Well, it sounds like it's a, a desert island from the 1970s, doesn't it? 
<laughs> well, so you got like a kind of a, a, a staying alive style disco or sort of. <laughs> well, that could be arranged, Kingsley. Yeah. yeah. What are you saying? Are you saying I'm living in the past? This is a shocking <laughs> accusation. Is it going to be called Jessup's Island? This one, then? <laughs> <laughs> well, naming Alan our Island. Island. Alan Jessup's Island. Yeah. <laughs> Will, what do you think? Oh, I think, Roger, you, you will be allowed to use power. Well, I think which allows you to use power. So I think making exposures by moonlight, we know, seriously, it's going to take an awful long time to make a print exposure. So I think you should, you should avail yourself of the, of the facilities and plug into the mains. Well, thank you but very so, much. Great choice of Enlarger. Very happy with that. And what you said about Act for Record Rapid, that does bring back fond memories. And you're absolutely right. Fantastic paper. No, good luck to you. you. See, you look. The thing is about that's the thing. You look. You look backwards, and I. I think I've. I've tried to look forwards in my selection. That's where we differ. And if I look back, I guess my selection would be, wouldn't be hugely dissimilar from yours in many ways. Well, that leads us on to um, Kingsley, who pre presumably is going to be taking a large amount of first aid um, <laughs> kits, bandages to ensure that he's. Uh, he patches himself up every time he goes out and takes landscape pictures. But other than that, Kingsley, why don't you run through your eight? Yeah, shark repellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, the funny thing, so my selection is not sort of dissimilar to Will's in some ways, because it's kind of like I was sort of thinking, well, what what would I like to be? You know, the, the, I suppose the idea is that you're going to be doing a lot of photography and I guess I'm guessing this is going to be a picturesque landscape, uh, desert island that I'm going to be on. So it's a kind of a landscapey list. So I'm starting off with my DSLR, which is the Nikon D850, which is, you know, pound for pound, I reckon the best DSLR ever made. And the reason I, I, I briefly thought, well, oh, should I upgrade to like a mirrorless thing? And then I thought I, I wasn't sure about the power thing either. So I thought, well, actually, although obviously DSLRs need power to shoot, at least with an optical viewfinder, I can look through it if it runs out of power and keep myself sane that way, you know. Um, Len and uh, so a couple of lenses with that. I've picked um, Sigma 14 to 24 f2.8 Art and Nikon 7200 f2.8. Um, and the reason for that is because I figured it would cover, you know, a decent range, missing a bit in the middle maybe, but I don't, not too worried about the middle because you could always crop in on the D850 and achieve some sort of some kind of um you know middling focal length um you know sort of by doing that um similar tripod choice to wills um i i had to grab mine to actually see what it's called so it's a jitso gt 3533 ls i mean i i when i kind of look at these tripod names i always think that they should name them like you know excelsior or you know firebird or something like that to make them a bit more but i guess it means something to some guy in northern italy um and i unlike will i basically counted the bull head as part of the tripod on that although obviously they are um right. separable or sort of inseparable in my case because i think it's been whacked with something right. um on top of that <laughs> so i'm not you arresting the... a fall of yours was it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're or beating off a bear or something um <laughs> So I also um, will be packing a Lee SW150 filter kit plus a load of filters because a bit like Will saying, oh, I need a camera cleaning, sensor cleaning kit and then basically piling in a thousand and one items. Um, I've decided that, you know, as part of that filter kit, you know, obviously I'm going to have big stoppers, little stoppers, um, you know, various NDs, grads, polarizers, whatever I need. Um, maybe even a, a sort of a, to, to, to hark back to your own 1970s island, maybe I'll have some sort of star filter thing going on in there. Oh, as yeah, well. The rainbow one. Yeah, the yeah one or the kind want. of like something like that. Um, th so from there, so I also, I, I quite fancy taking a sort of a motorized tripod head to do a bit of time lapse stuff. So I thought that would be a kind of a way of amusing yourself. So I've gone for a, I'm never quite sure how to say, is it syrup genie? Sip, syrup, syrup. Yeah. Um, and there's so that's a Genie 2 linear, which I've never used, but it looked expensive. And so I, <laughs> I imagine it's probably quite good. Um, uh, so, on t so what am I up to? I'm up to six there, aren't I? I think. Yes. Um, well, but, so, but given that you're bending the rules all over the place, the same as well. Yeah, six, then, yeah I six, think we're up to about 75 at the six, moment. 36, let's yeah, call it six, it. shall we? <laughs> So the next one, so number seven, I decided I'm going to take my drone with me, um, which is a DJI Mavic Pro 2. 
uh, which is sort of, I, I would describe it as in virtually mint condition because I've, I've used it so rarely. I got it, brilliant. This would be a great thing to use for landscapes and other stuff. And um, I've had this kind of, this kind of paroxysm of of doubt about it. Every time I get it out, it's kind of like, oh, you're just going to be annoying someone with this thing, aren't you? But I figure if I'm on my own on a desert island, then I can practice. The, and you've seen these kind of um, these aerial drone landscapes. And the ones that really interest me are the kind of the ones where it's looking straight down and it's kind of, you know, it'd be some sort of lovely shoreline or, a, you know, or a, a top down view of a pirate ship coming to sack the island or something. Um, <laughs> So where does that lead? So that just leaves me one left, doesn't it? It does. So I'm going to go for the ever-present in every camera bag that I've got, and that's a shower cap. And the reason I have a shower cap, obviously, is because it's um, it's the go-to rain repellent. Even though, like, you know, the D850 is weather sealed and all that stuff, but um, you, you're never quite sure, are you? And so what I do is I make a point of whenever I'm staying in a hotel, I nick the shower cap so oh. that I've got a, a lifetime supply of things to stretch over camera bodies um and you know, like maybe i can sort of use it to kind of like maybe you know if i need to kind of attract jellyfish for some reason i can leave it on the beach to kind of uh i i have this i in my head now kingsley i've got this view that you have some sort of luminescent shower cap that you put on when you go out and take pictures just to kind of get yourself in the mood <laughs> that to get my mojo yeah <laughs> that could be my way of signaling passing ships couldn't it um <laughs> Okay, so those right, so those are your eight things. So obviously the shower cap's the one you're keeping, right? I so the one I'm keep. I think I'd keep. I probably keep the drone because because I've used it so little. Its, mm. it's value has remained high, um, <laughs> and also I guess um, potentially it'll be useful for like if I could rig it up somehow to drop coconuts on pirates' heads and you know repel <laughs> giant crabs and things like that. Maybe that would be somehow advantageous and like I, as i say i haven't used it much and it's one of those things that i can keep thinking i must go out and use that and it's a bit like we've said in previous things about just taking out one lens what i tend to do is i'll, I'll go somewhere and i'll have I'll, I'll stick that in the bag along with my camera and then i just end up shooting as normal and the drone stays in the bag but so what i would try to do but perhaps this is the thing of after the great flood and all i have is left is the drone that will finally force me to to use it and try and sort of get the best out of it fantastic and what about a book? Um, so for a book, I've gone for Susan Sontag's On Photography. Oh, and, my God. Well, I know nothing about it. I've never read it. Um, I, I, I believe I'll that, tell you uh, what, you won't when you're on the, <laughs> you're on the desert. Island. <laughs> so I, I guess if it's like a, I mean, well, maybe if it's terrible, I can eat it or something. Uh, <laughs> Pretty heavy. From my, from my recollection, I, I remember reading it or trying to read it for A-level photography. And it, it was pretty heavy going. But, it, yeah. but it's one of those kind of like, it's recognised as being one of those kind of essential reads, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and if you did a web survey and said, you know, pick the 10 most important books on photography, that would be in the top 10. Mm. So I kind of, I mean, the, and the other thing was I, I kind of thought, well, obviously there's a lot of things that you could take, which are kind of um, how to's and stuff like that. But you probably want something a little bit more challenging, maybe on a while you're whiling away the rest of your years. Um, and for my luxury, funnily enough, Will mentioned this already, but I've gone for a grand piano, um, <laughs> which I've decided I could, you know, there's multiple uses, aren't you? So like if, if you, I mean, I, I try to learn the piano. I'm not particularly good at it, but um, initially I thought I would take my electric piano, but then I thought, no, a grand piano is more useful, isn't it? Because you can sort of, you can sleep under it. You could probably sleep in it. Um, you could probably, you know, float it out to sea if you needed to <laughs> smash some of the legs off of firewood. It's like a it's a it's a Swiss army knife of pianos. Yeah, that is quite intriguing to see how we've looked at it quite differently in a way. Um, I'm, I'm doubting now my nostalgia choices, but I, I think I'll uh, maybe what we should do is see if we can get somebody to actually drop us off on a desert island for a couple of weeks with our kit and see who actually is ready to throw it into the sea by, by the time they come home again. So, well, thanks for that, gents. Um, if obviously we would love to hear um, any input that the readers that, that you guys have got uh, in terms of your ideas for desert island kits and the and the reasons why. Um, if you send send those to podcast at photographynews.co.uk, we would love to hear um, the kits that you would like to be uh, sent away to a desert island with. And obviously, if we get some really cracking ones, then we'll we'll read them out in uh, in future podcasts. So so do please get in touch. 
Um, it's also worth mentioning that obviously photographynews.co.uk, our website, is being regularly updated with news. You can also read the magazine digitally there, uh, which is uh, free. So if you don't get to see a printed copy, because we appreciate maybe a little bit harder to get hold of a printed copy at the moment, uh, then you can read it every month for free online, which leads me quite nicely onto Will. Is there anything, anything you've just sent an issue to press? Anything yeah. in particular that readers should be looking out for in the next issue? Well, we've just sent the latest issue to press, as you say, that's issue number 79. Um, that's got the final part of our summer festival where we look at video, photo and techniques. Sorry, photo and video kit and techniques. Um, big news story, and that's Canon's multitude of launches. They launched 11 items recently, including the Canon EOS R5 and the R6. The R5 being particularly noteworthy because it shoots 8K video, which is amazing, apparently. I mean, the, the guy, the PR guy who uh, told me the quality is amazing, you shoot 20 minutes full time with it as well. And the thing about it, of course, is that not only can you shoot 8K video, but if you take a still out of that 8K video, each individual frame is around 35 megabit, megabytes of resolution. So you can wow. basically just film something and grab a shot later. And the, 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 the big test in that issue, speaking of Nikon flagships like you were with the, uh, the F6, F5, What's F3? F3. F3. Keep going down. <laughs> you will get <laughs> so there in the end. It's F3. Um, but we've got to test the Nikon D6 in the latest issue as well, which is the flagship they brought out for this big sporting year. That would have been a big sporting year. And uh, it's their flagship. So we've got to test that in the latest issue too. Moving on. It's time to get some answers to some reader questions. Uh, everybody who has got in touch with us has done so on podcast at photographynews.co.uk. You can also get in touch with us uh, on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and the handle for that is at photonewspn. So without further ado, uh, two questions. Will, I'm going to come to you on the first one because uh, this lady, Audrey, who lives in Brighton, got in touch and said, Will talked about shooting from the hip at the end of the last podcast. Could he give some more detail, please, about camera settings, lens choice, etc., as I haven't had much success so far? So, Will? Well, one thing about it, Audrey, is that it's a technique you do need to practice because shooting from the hip means you're not looking through the viewfinder. So you do kind of have to point and pray a little bit. But I use a Fujifilm X-E3 which is a fixed monitor camera, so I, I can't flip it up or anything. And I've learned to use that by, by it's just, it is by guesswork and experience and the height of the camera, trying to keep it level. And on that, I've got an 18 millimeter lens, which equates in the 35 millimeter format to a 28 millimeter wide angle. So I use that for my, my street photography. I, sh I set an ISO of 800 or even higher. And that's because you want to get a sharp picture, basically, because you know, all sorts of things might be moving. You know, you might be moving because you're using the camera unconventionally. Your subject might be moving too. So I said, I tend to set high ISO, 800. I know a lot of street photographers do the same sort of thing. I'll use aperture priority, but if you prefer to use manual, that's fine. I set F8 on the lens, and with a high ISO, that means I normally get a decently good shutter speed for action stopping pictures. In terms of focusing, there's this, this all two ways of looking at it, Audrey. You can either use the camera's autofocus and set face detect and that can work really well or if you prefer just set manual focus you set manual focus set the distance at three meters from your camera and you soon you soon get to learn what is three meters from you once you start shooting and practicing now i find with the, the, the lens i've got which is a wide angle i tend to get in a bit closer than that um but that because i actually want to get a closer shot of the faces and the and, and try and fill the frame but it's, it's entirely up to you how you work so basically, I'll use a wide angle lens, a smallish aperture to get good depth of field, a high ISO, another manual or autofocus, or autofocus, depending how you see fit. But autofocus at the moment is wonderful. If you use autofocus with face detect for street work, it can work really, really well. But Audrey, the key thing about it is to me, get yourself a setup and just practice with it, particularly with the framing of it. You are gonna get lots of shots of people's feet, people's heads, Indeed, some of those shots can actually work really quite well. Um, I mean, it hasn't done my part any harm, um, but you can get some really good shots by just being a, a bit inventive and just trying. And it's, if you're shooting digital, and I assume you are, 
then practice is free. So do you find yourself shooting typically with primes based on that, which were going to give you a better idea of your framing as you're shooting in that way? Yeah, that's what I do with, with 18 mil. I know roughly how close I need to be if I want a, a picture of a person, you know, with the head and the feet included in shot. So I've got a rough idea of the distance I want. And I like shooting from the hip also because, because I have the camera basically sitting on my chest. A lot of the shots I'm shooting, rather than head height, I'm looking up at people. Because a lot, not, not everybody walks around with their head up in the air. They Often people are walking down, especially nowadays, with, a, with their heads looked in the, aiming towards the ground, especially, for instance, I like shooting markets. And if you go to a market store to shoot vendors, most people are looking down at things. They're not looking up. So by having the camera on your chest, you are getting a better perspective, I think. So rather than getting the tops of people's heads, you looking up into people's faces. So there's a chance of getting some interesting shots that way. The other thing I was just going to add as well, Will, is that some, depending on what camera, um, Audrey doesn't actually say which camera she has, but uh, some cameras now, you now have apps, don't you? So you could actually have an app on your phone that effectively gives you a live view of your of your of what your camera is seeing and so you could actually pretend to be on your phone while yep. you're actually sort of wandering around and taking pictures of people no that's a great idea and it works really well i, I do use that with the fuji vim xe3 the only thing i found with it is that battery life goes quickly not only your camera but also your phone right and as long as you get used to the timing of it as well because you know on the on these apps and phones it, you know pushing the button the shutter the virtual shutter button is not always instantaneous so you have to kind of predict what might happen but if you are trying to get some sneaky candidates, that's a great way of working, to be fair. Great way of working. Excellent. And just, just going back to the um to the the projects that you'd been doing previously in lockdown, do you find um taking your clothes off helps you shoot from the hip at all? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly gets attention. <laughs> yeah, I thought you're supposed to be a little bit more covert than that though, when you're out taking fish. <laughs> it's a new technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope that answers your question, Audrey. Um, very comprehensive. Thanks thanks very much, Will. Um, and then we'll move on to the other question, which is aimed at you, Kingsley, from a chat called Nigel Rivers, who lives in Portsmouth. And he said, I've been really enjoying your podcast, and I looked you all up on Instagram. Kingsley, he says, has done some great images of dogs, and I'd like to get some better images of my pooch. Can he pass on some tips that will help me get a better shots with my Sony A6300? Right. I think he got, I think he was on your Instagram, Kings. He might have got somebody else's. <laughs> might have been that other one that's doing it properly. Yeah. I should point out those two. I've got two Instagram accounts, one for my sort of landscape things and one for my dogs thing. It's, it's like Kingsley Photo and then Kingsley Photo Dogs, which is a bit Shall of a Shall we mask. assume he's looked at your landscapes one then? Yeah, there you go. There might have been a dog in one of them somewhere. Um, so dog photography. I think that I mean it's a very broad thing, isn't it? That um you know, you, you'd think there's lots of different ways of doing dog photography, you know, particularly you've got just off the top of my head, um, action and, you know, portraits, which are supposed to the two things that I do um, most of all. Um, but I, I mean, sort of in terms of general tips, um, I don't think the A6300 has this, but the more modern Sonys have got an animal IAF function, which can be very, very useful, particularly for portraits. I think if, if the dog, I mean, a lot of people say it's great for action shots as well i think if something's moving you know if something's flying towards you i would still probably think that you know it's going to be a bit hit and miss um but i think like a lot of it comes down to behavioral stuff really so it's kind of like it's about getting the dog to sort of be comfortable and, and sort of slightly less aware of you as you know the, the person sticking a big lens towards it um <laughs> And a lot of the ways you can do that is obviously the the, the things like you know using treats and lures. Um, I've I've sort of attached um, dog biscuits to all sorts of things, you know, like the end of your lens or window panes and stuff to get dogs to look in particular directions. But partly, what you find is that um, when you start doing a, a shoot with a dog, that they're very excitable because they've just met you and they're not really sure of you. And so you you can try and get pictures at the start and sometimes that'll work but quite often you just have to wait until they're less interested in you and they go off and they start doing their own thing so i mean without knowing exactly what the what what um our reader is sort of looking for um it's it's sort of tricky to to advise so so if 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 
well, let's let's just help you out a little bit. So maybe, so what about from from a portraiture perspective? I mean, I, if I recall looking at your pictures, they're all quite sort of evenly lit. So I'm assuming that you're working under under some degree of cover. Um, and, and what about things like focusing? Because obviously, with a snout, um, <laughs> it's easy to focus on the nose and get the eyes soft. So so what about those two things, for example? Yeah. So like, I mean, in in terms of portraiture stuff, it's it's remarkably similar to taking pictures of people. And so, you know, you want to get the eyes sharp. So you need to get the focus point in that area because mm -hmm. quite a lot of the times the camera, if you're leaving more of an more of a kind of an automatic um, approach, quite often the camera will pick up the nose because mm -hmm. there's a sort of a, a texture and a shape to it. Um, and like what you say about lighting. Yeah, again, it's just like you do with with people pictures, really. You'd kind of want, if possible, to have your subject in sort of in even and soft lighting. Um, which is going to mean they're not too contrasty. Quite often I shoot with the light behind the dog, you know, with the dog in shade and with some sort of, you know, sunlit stuff behind them. That kind of always works. And then without wanting to um, overburden yourself with kit. I mean, I, I've tried using reflectors and I often use flash on location, but most of the time I just dial in a bit of a positive exposure compensation to make sure that you're you're lighting the subject a bit better so you're not sort of underexposing. Um, and that that's, that's very simple. The, the only thing you've got to watch with that is that um, as you add positive exposure compensation, your shutter speed, if you're in aperture priority, which is what I would be, um, your shutter speed is going to fall and dogs will quite often be moving a bit. And the, so they may blur. So, you know, you, you, you have to kind of watch your shutter speed in those situations. Uh, and what about um, from a from the movement perspective? So I think you said earlier that you photograph your dogs running along the beach. That's obviously quite a challenge, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, again, so shutter speed on that, I think you're looking at a minimum of about two thousandths of a second if you want to get something perfectly sharp. Mm -hmm. um, focusing, I tend to use a, a tracking. I, I use uh, AF continuous and then I use a, a small group and I position that roughly where I know the dog's head's going to be. Um, one of the things that I do, it, although I kind of, I use most of the time of this 70 to 200 F2.8 that I mentioned on the Desert Island kits thing. Um, but if you, quite often, if you shoot wide open that, it can be a bit tricky because the subject's moving towards you so fast that the depth of field is kind of small and it struggles to keep up. Mm -hmm. So I tend to shoot like F3.5 just to give myself a little bit more kind of help. And, and then th there's other things that you can look for, which is like body shape. There's a particular thing that happens in dog photography, like action dog photography, where quite often a dog will push with its two back feet at the same time. And what happens is if you catch it at the wrong point, it basically just looks like they're sitting or squatting because the two back feet are down and the front feet are up. Right. Um, so the best the best looking pictures sort of tend to be ones where one or both of the front legs are down. And that's just something that you get, you know, and then you can you can sort of look to try and time that or you can you know I, I can't remember the frame rate of that um sony camera but i i would imagine it's fairly high um so you can leave it on a burst mode and then you know shoot sort of dozens of pictures and try and pick out the, the one where the, the body shape is best absolutely well that's that's uh, that's really good advice um hopefully uh, there's some useful stuff for you there nigel and you'll be able to get some some nice shots of uh, of your dog um, please send them through to us. Love to see them um, when you when you've taken a few. Um, well, we we've rattled on for quite a long time, gents. Um, so I think we probably need to uh, bring this podcast to a close. But obviously, we wouldn't bring a podcast to a close without a a Will's word of wisdom. So, Will, what have you got for us this time? Um, my tip this time, Raj, is um, a simple one. Now that the shops are open again, and if you haven't got one, of course. Um, buy a polarizing filter. I mean, it's a one filter, it's a fact that you can't replicate in software, not well anyway, and it's so useful. Not only can it saturate your skies, make them more blue. Be careful though, don't make them over blue. Be make white clouds stand out, cut down on glare, cut down off reflections off uh, surfaces like uh, water and wood and rocks and things like that. And it's such a wonderful filter to have, and only it absorbs maybe one or two stops of light. Um, so it's a fantastic filter to use. You can also use it as a makeshift ND because it absorbs a little bit of light, although it's obviously it's limited. But it's the the one filter every photographer I think should have. And that, for my tip is um, for this episode, is yeah, buy a polarizing filter. You won't regret it. 
and it, and it is possible as well if I, if I think I'm right that you can overpolarize so people tend to stick up when they first get a polarizer they stick it on and whack it round to maximum polarization but that can cause um, a situation where in a blue sky for example one bit's darker and the other bit's lighter and stuff is that right yeah i mean if you overpolarize if, if you went to let's say to the mediterranean mediterranean on holiday should you manage it this year and you're photographing one of those Greek houses against a blue sky and you put the polarizer on, you'll find the sky will come out almost black, uh, completely mm. unnatural. So in some cases, yeah, don't polarize at all like in some cases. And the other things I've noticed, some, and I've, when, I, when I've done uh, tuition courses and things like that, some people use a polarizer, leave it on, they just leave it on the lens as a standard, as a protection filter, basically. Mm -hmm. Whereas don't do that. It's no point because you're losing two stops of light but just use it in conditions when a polarizer is needed. And that's basically, basically when the sun's shining, there's a lot of light being scattered around, bouncing off surfaces, and you want to, you want to cut down the glare or, cut, or, or intensify a, a sky, for instance. So, you know, don't have a polarizer on your filter, on your lens all the time. Just use it sparingly in the right conditions. Well, fantastic bit of advice, Will. Thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of another pm podcast we hope you've you've found this uh, useful and interesting and as i said um, halfway through it'd be lovely to hear your desert island kits so that just leaves us to say goodbye to my two colleagues who've joined me today so first of all cheers kingsley thanks for your time get your microphone <laughs> set up earlier next time <laughs> thank you very much for having me I, I that was a quick thought can we see each other from our desert islands can we kind of like uh... Are we allowed to wave to each other from these things? Well, I, I must admit, I'm quite surprised that you didn't take a 300 mil so that That's you could true. just sit yeah. in one place yeah. on your desert island and photograph <laughs> everything from there. <laughs> so you presumably would be able to see us. I, I don't know. Do, 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 yeah, get some clothes on. If we could see each other, you could send the drone over, couldn't you? That's true, yeah, to deliver coconuts. <laughs> Well, maybe that's maybe that's we'll discuss that next time. <laughs> and, and thanks also, Mr. Photography. Thanks very much, Will Chung. A pleasure, always. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your photography, and we'll speak to you again soon. Cheers. We're both very well and enjoying the easing of the lockdown a little further. Wingsy, uh, Wingsley? <laughs> <laughs> it's all over the place today, isn't it? <laughs> that should be Is my that flight. That'd be my that pilot's isn't? name. That'd be my pilot's name. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, I'll try that bit again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right well we've got the bit for the end anyway yeah, that's, we've got the uh, dead air all sorted yeah